So race is an idea, an ideology, an identity that's that was imposed by Europeans to divide humanity between themselves and those they sought to exploit. It justifies economic exploitation and violence. It's directly linked to colonialism. And these phenomena, race, racism, and enslavement, were all born at the same time. As European invaders encountered people and lands they wanted to exploit, they needed justification to kidnap, enslave, and plunder people and resources. To do so, they divided the world into to white civilized Christians and pretty much everybody else. Dark skin color became a sign of barbarity, savagery, and backwardness. Often under the guise of bringing civilization and Christianity, Europeans assigned people worldwide to a racial hierarchy in which we still live, in which many whites still believe that people of color are inferior to themselves. And this is what's really so important, is that these racial definitions that were created 500 years ago are still very much present, not only on specific locations, but also globally. Um, laws and norms imposed hundreds of years ago about property ownership, access to education, healthcare, jobs, resources, um, and access to all of those often reflect structural and institutional racism that goes unseen and is taken for granted as the natural order of things. Colonized education is exactly this. And so looking at what educational colonialism is, it is at heart in the direct service to the colonial regime and for colonial profit. The system was not designed to benefit the colonized, and nor does it, even when exceptions, such as those who achieve highly appear. It doesn't promote emancipation or liberation. Instead, it perpetuates an existing coloniality of power. It also ingrains in children an imaginary of color, one that perpetuates conceptions of the colonized as backwards, uncivilized, infantile, and more importantly, educable only for the purposes of serving the colonizer. Simultaneously, this imaginary of color posits the colonizer, who are usually whites, but not always, um, as superior in every way. The people that should be emulated, those who are rational, intelligent, organized, bringers of civilization, modernity, and technological change. Mechanisms of colonial education are so deeply embedded in most colonized, education, edu colonized nations that they go largely unseen, taken for granted, even as they replicate centuries of submission. <clears throat> Looking at some examples of this, um, just broadly, when we look um, from a cross-national perspective, we see that this is accomplished through ad administrative structures, classroom practices, and curricular materials, among other things. This is what I tend to focus on. Um, when it comes to administration, um, admin ed coloni colonial educational administrators often support colonial and white supremacist ideologies. Principals and teachers are often white in schools with large populations of children of color. And even when administrators are not white, the, are, their ideologies reflect similar ideas and believe that black and indigenous children are inferior. And so related to this then, parents' demands are often included, as are those of various community organizations. Um, a lot of times you see that administrators um, assume parents don't know what, what is best for their children, which is a really paternalistic attitude at the heart of it. Um, however, in all the research that I've done, I've found that parents are the ones that know best what their children should be doing in the classroom, how best they should be educated so that they can succeed according to what it is they're interested in. And so we see that knowledge disseminated in these classrooms is based on what elites, whites, or other colonial governments believe is important or superior. <clears throat> Let's see. And we see that instead of looking at what people in the colony really believe to be important, we see that what's focused on is what the colonizers think is important. We see historical and contemporary discrimination, oppression, and exclusion absent from the curriculum. If we're going to address these in any society, we actually have to talk about what they are, how they operate, what the different mechanisms are, how it's embedded in different structures, and what the consequences are. We see that colonized children um, are often taught that they don't eat, speak, uh, write correctly, 
and they must be corrected consistently. There's usually an emphasis on discipline rather than knowledge acquisition. So we see this constantly in schools in the United States where, for example, there's far more um, police officers in school than guidance counselors in our schools. Um, and we see that students are often not given the help when they're needed, when it's needed. Um, and they're not given the help that they actually need um, either. And so finally, then we see such things, especially, you know, you see from a historian's perspective. Um, we see that the enslaved and the indigenous are consistently dehumanized in a, very, a variety of ways. Um, one of the things that I found really fascinating was the Dutch absolved themselves of responsibility for all violence through the use of passive voice. And you'll see some quotes of this. Um, and there's also really no mention of Dutch enslavers. Um, they, they're quite proud of their trade in enslaved Africans as this is part of their national identity, of course, of being you know great traders. And so there's a lot of discussion about how the Dutch were great traders. Um, but when it comes to Dutch enslavers on the plantation, there is one mention of a Dutch enslaver, and that is it in all of these books. Um, and then we see resistance absent or vilified, and I'll give you some examples of that. So looking at some of the quotes, um, these were, you can see these also are in books from like 1952 or something. These are really quite recent. Everyone can see those. Okay, super. Um, so this was, the first quote was one where I, so all of these are housed in um, the Dutch Royal Library in The Hague, which, you know, it's an archive, so you have to be quiet, which was a challenge for me at times, especially seeing this first quote. So um, the term middle passage was not actually used um, in really any book, um, but that's what they were talking about. For whites, the middle passage was, quote, a dangerous undertaking as a result. Many did not make the trip back. Others contracted sicknesses and died. Um, so you see, very, like from this, that sympathy, it, the books are meant to generate sympathy for white people. You also have to think about who the prospective readers are. Clearly, this is not meant for a child of African descent because, I mean, come on, really? It was hard for white people? I just, yeah. Um, and then you have things like this. Slaves were needed for the work on the plantations. Um, you have a lot of this where the use of work or labor is used rather than um, like forced labor. And I think work and labor on its own is very different because that's something that children expect people to be paid for. Forced labor in slave labor camps is something quite different. Um, there's also really no discussion, well, why were they needed? You know, why couldn't the white Dutch people do this? I mean, these are the kind of questions that I ask as an educator in reading these quotes, but there was none of that explanation. It just said, you know, slaves were needed for work on the plantation, um, so there were plenty of slaves that were available to do that, something like that. Um, and then you have things that, um, again, we see a lot of essentialization of Africans as enslaved people. So in most books, rather than saying people were taken from Africa and enslaved, it says slaves were taken from Af Africa. So Slava out Africa was just all in most of the books. Um, so, and then you see something like this, where then you're creating this hi uh, hierarchy of essentialized races. Um, black men from Africa were much better slaves than Native Americans. Um, so again, you're seeing this essentialization. Um, of course, there's no discussion about how um, the colonists wiped out all of these people through genocidal violence and d diseases that they brought. Um, it's just the explanation of why black people were going to do this labor. Um, this, this is your explanation, that they were better, they were better at being slaves. Um, and then you see, this is the justification that I was talking about. Dutch merchants earned a lot of money from the slave trade, as if that is sufficient to um, justify the kidnapping and enslavement of millions of people. Um, some other examples. Uh, this is what I'm talking about when I, when I say the passive voice. So as soon as you shift from the trade in enslaved Africans to the enslaving of Africans on plantations, it flips to the passive voice. We never know who is responsible. So the slaves were treated badly. Well, who treated them badly? I mean, that's kind of important. There's no, I mean, we're missing, um, you know, the subject of the sentence here that becomes occluded through the use of passive voice. Um, and then you have, again, this kind of these, all these quotes that generate sympathy for white people. So on plantations, the whites did not have it easy. Um, another book, it is way too hot to work the land. Fortunately, our slaves are used to this heat. So again, kind of essentializing and justifying enslavement. 10% of books actually said the life of a slave was not so bad in the eyes of whites. I started coding for the phrase, um, uh, niet so slecht, just because it came up so often, but 10% of the books that mention um, uh, Dutch enslavement actually say not that bad. 
um, which, okay. Um, and then you see stuff like this, not all planters were bad to slaves on their plantation, which, which does a number of things. First of all, it suggests that there were actually people that were quite bad without saying what exactly that means. But the other thing is this, it, it individualizes the enslaver without linking enslavement to a larger system of global capitalist exploitation. And I think that that's really important, this missing aspect of this, that this was about individuals rather than entire system that built up entire nations. Um, and then when it comes to resistance, um, you really don't see a lot of it, and when you do, those who are resisting are really depicted as um, violent and unjustifiably violent. They're often depicted with an angry look on their face, with spears in their hand, just wearing a loincloth, somewhere in the forest somewhere. Um, and again, the sympathy is very much for um, white people. So something like this from the jungles, they attack the plantations, they set the sugarcane field and the house of the planter on fire. Um, so this is something that I think clearly is written for white students and is meant to uh, generate sympathy for the enslavers rather than, ens than the enslaved who were seeking their freedom and liberation. Looking at Africa, we see that their history begins with European contact and dis discovery. Um, two books mention um, any kind of community or civilization prior to Europeans' arrival, and that's it. The rest of them, the discussion of Africa, starts with um, Europeans discovered the coast of Africa, blah, 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 as if these people weren't there, as if they didn't have wonderful civilizations, building um, you know, fantastically complex economic, political systems, as well as um, architecture. Instead, Africa, as it's discussed really as kind of a, a country rather than individual countries themselves. Um, it lacks civilization, technology, and modernity. However, it is full of violence, chaos, hunger, sickness, and poverty. Um, it exists as a site of extraction for whites and exploitation, where the whites are basically needed to bring about civilization and modernity. Um, you then, like after, uh, usually the discussion of Africa goes from enslavement to the Berlin Conference to independence really, really quickly, but usually just South Africa, and only one book actually mentions Nelson Mandela by name. Um, they do discuss European colonialism with the Berlin Conference, um, and usually that's just with a map that is like shaded all the different colors depending on who is colonizing them. But there's no discussion of what colonialism actually meant. And usually if it is discussed, it's talked about as a way for um, Europeans to bring these backward African nations some form of civilization and modernity as if um, they're kind of benevolent colonizers. And when independence is discussed, it's really talked about as bringing chaos, that these people are not ready for this, they need European Western guidance, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the cartoons that are in some of the books are really rather absurd. Um, and you see then that as we move into the contemporary period, Africa is depicted as uh, having European intervention necessary through neoliberal, neocolonial philanthropy and especially development. Um, so there's usually some you know, photo of a, a starving child in Ethiopia and you know, isn't it wonderful that these European nations are doing so much to help these nations that can't help themselves basically. Um, so, to kind of summarize, we see that colonized Dutch education, it serves a colonial power, it's not for the emancipation of full humanity of people in the colonies or non-whites, non-Christians in continental Netherlands. The power and knowledge of people in the colony is not acknowledged or valued. Um, you never hear voices, by the way, of people from um, any of the colonies ever. And you very rarely hear voices of people of color either. Um, even I have a paper on discussing immigrants and you only hear the voices of immigrants when they're saying how wonderful the Netherlands is compared to their horrible country full of violence that they fled from. Um, and so when we think about this cumulatively, what goes on in the classroom, what goes on in the cu curriculum, we see that this is gonna play a really important role in limiting the social, political, and economic opportunities and futures for colonized people in these places. Um, and so it reproduces racial inequalities locally as well as on a global scale. So then we need to think about what is decolonized education. 
And one of the goals that we want is an emancipatory, at least you know, that me and my colleagues would argue, is that we want an emancipatory imaginary of color, where we are attentive to students' needs and interests, um, students are engaged with classroom and text-based materials, there's an identification with the school, they're happy to go there, they're proud to be at that school, they feel comfortable in school, they don't feel like they're going to be critiqued for speaking a certain language or speaking the official language with an accent, um, or maybe about their clothes or their hair, or whatever it is, um, one of the things that we see in de uh, decolonized education is that we don't see behavioral quote unquote problems because kids are engaged. Um, we have high success rates measured in multiple ways, not just kind of a standardized test, but multiple forms of learning. Um, critical thinking is of course very important. Um, rote memorization is really not gonna be useful for most jobs except the most lowest skills and if we want our children to be um, leaders in whatever field they need to be thinking critically. Um, we we need, to, we need our students to be empowered um, to create their own emancipation and liberation. So looking at decolonized classrooms specifically, these would be led by teachers with deep connections to and understandings of the community. We can't always have teachers with deep connections to, this, to the, the communities, but hopefully they at least have deep understandings of the community. Um, it seeks input constantly from parents, students, and community leaders. It integrates students' cultures. It focuses on students' strengths. I think one of the things that all teachers tend to do, and I, I would put myself in this category, is that we tend to look for what students do wrong like how can we correct them and what they're doing um, rather than looking at what the student is doing well. Um, providing full support for students' holistic needs, so academic of course, but also thinking about ways that the school can offer mental and physical health um, uh, services as well as economic needs. Um, and then it prepares students to lead their nation with practical, political, and academic lessons. And when it comes to curriculum, we would like to see a decolonial imaginary of color re-articulating a colonized self-conception so that students see themselves in a positive way. So this is, what, um, this is what you were talking about, that students are not ashamed of their color of their skin or how their hair is styled or any of that, that they see themselves and they're proud of themselves for who they are. Um, the histories of the people, discussions of historic and contemporary oppression, because again, you cannot challenge oppression if you do not understand how it operates, um, and especially the mechanisms that maintain that inequality today. Whether it's, you know, in the United States, one of the biggest focuses right now is looking at a system of mass incarceration um, and policing. So how do we talk about that in ways that students are then going to be able to leave the classroom to challenge that system? Um, a focus on achievements and accomplishments of the people, science, in all field, science, medicine, politics, agriculture, technology, music, art, sports, etc. Um, and then resistance to colonialism. How have people done this in the past? How are people doing it today? Um, who are the freedom fighters? What are they doing? What's been successful? What's not been su successful so that we can learn from that? So that is all I have for you today. I am very much looking forward to your comments and your questions. Um, thank you all so much for your attention. My name is Vivian Roberts, and I'm here to represent the Catholic School Board. Um, I consider the University of St. Martin, should I say, one of my ex-part-time homes, along with some of my colleagues that I'm seeing sitting here. And um, I hope that um, whatever questions you have or whatever suggestions we will receive this evening, will benefit us in um, trying our utmost to do what we are supposed to do for our youth. My name is Mirai Regales peterson I'm the department head of the Sundial School, a school that is a, under the auspices of SVOBE, along with the sister school, Milton Peters College. So we're a high school. And um, yes, it's good to hear information because there's a part of what you're stating concerning history. I studied history. Well, I got interested in history when I started learning about my own Caribbean history. And that is the truth. And I studied history for that same goal. But yes, there are points that we need to take into consideration. And I guess with a panel discussion and with questions, we will all come to some sort of consensus on moving forward. Thank you.
My name is Claire Elshot Aventurin. I'm the president of the Windward Islands Teachers Union and also the co-host of this event. Um, I'm also the president of the Windward Islands Teachers Union and I am very happy to have Dr. Weiner, Weiner here with us this evening to share this information because coincidentally, and I'm going to do something, I'm going to put two persons on the spot. Coincidentally, we have had the privilege to have or to host here on Monday and Tuesday um, the meeting of the COPAL, um, which is Latin American and the Caribbean nations here at Great Bay. And the topic was also on what actually decolonization and what these states should do at the UN to make their voices heard. <laughs> Represented there, we had Bonaire, for example, with their group saying, Mike Bonaire back, means I want Bonaire back. And also another um, action group. We also had Stacia there. And in our midst tonight, we have two persons that made use of this opportunity and also the invitation to be at this event tonight. So I'll let them introduce themselves. Just bear with me before we start our panel discussion. Here we have Mr. Cope. Good night, my name is Carlisle Corbin. Uh, where you from? I'm from St. Croix. <laughs> Good night, my name is Lodesca Livingston. I'm from the archipelago of San Andres Province and Santa Catalina. And I'm in the field of education also. Good evening. It is indeed a, a privilege, pleasure to, to be here to share. Uh, my name is Dennis Baptist. I represent the Methodist Agogic Center Comprehensive Secondary Education, of course renamed by the students as Mac High. <laughs> I am grateful for the opportunity and I trust that as we engage in this um, exercise that we we'll all will benefit and, and share and I'll pause at this point. My name is Glendalyn Davis Holiday. I represent the Division Public Education, which is part of the Ministry of Education. And the Division Public Education um, is tasked with the managing of five primary schools, one special education primary level school, and the uh, Simon Vocation Training School, which is a secondary vocational level school. As I sat there tonight, I, I reflected back on my years in school where I loved history. And in my years of development into an adult, my major exposure with history was when I was in the YMCA and lately the PMIA, where those two organizations have grounded in self-esteem, self-value, and independence. And listening to Dr. Weiner speaking, and as an educator myself, it, it really makes you kind of bubbling. Because when you're in the classroom as an educator, and as persons who was into the DOT system, or still in the DOT system, the material and the methods and the programs that you have to teach Sometimes it really irks you of some of the things that you really had to share with the children. But I think I always say to my colleagues over the years, you may, you may be a teacher, but it's up to you to develop yourself by being involved in other organizations and being in your society. So whatever you have in the textbook, you can translate that and make sure that your children can also find a way to see themselves through it. So I really thank Dr. Um, Weiner. Weiner, Dr. Weiner and uh, <laughs> um, the president of the USM because when he came to me, I was like, you're serious? Mm -hmm. But um, I'm here tonight and I'm going to do my best to participate in this whole setting. Thank you. How do we go about 
acquiring material for our children in the classrooms, other than the methods that we are used to using. Um, are we planning on developing our own material? Now, I don't know if Dr. Weiner has a suggestion as to how we can use the textbooks that we have to work with, to change anything in it, in them. At one point, now I'm just going to say this, it sounds, um, I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. It sounds that we are, don't jump on me, okay? We are aiming to keep racism alive. Um, I know that's not the idea, but um, when, when, when you look at it or when you think about it, it sounds as if we are doing this. Mm -hmm.